Well, I'll just start into the preamble anyways. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have the uh, three of you here as uh, discussant partners. And uh, I really do want to thank Maria Zelanova for helping to put this event together. Um, the Native Association always thrives with a great community and uh, not least of which is our group of interns and program editors of which Maria is a, a sterling example. So thanks so much, Maria, for helping put this together. My name is, name is Robert Baines. I am the president of the NATO Association of Canada. We're a charitable NGO dedicated to informing Canadians about the value of security and the importance of NATO. It's not a message that most Canadians hear every day, uh, but it is one that they should think about from time to time. Security is inextricable from our everyday life. Uh, we, we live with the benefits of it no matter what. Uh, all of our cultural flourishing, our enjoyment of our lives is dependent on the work of many people that you might never see or meet, uh, but are working hard to ensure our security um, for now and, and hopefully for, for many years to come. Uh, so today we're going to be talking uh, about the vaccinations uh, that are, of course, traveling the world, uh, utilizing many different networks. Uh, every country is trying to ensure that it has enough vaccinations for their citizens. But at the same time, there are a, a great group of countries that are working to collaborate to ensure that these uh, vaccinations do get around uh, to uh, the whole of our community, of our global community. And uh, that's part of the non-zero sum belief that NATO is created out of, that the UN is created out of, and the rules-based international order writ large is founded upon. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we can kind of dig into these issues. Uh, and in order to help us uh, navigate this, I'm pleased to introduce once again, uh, Maria Zelanova, one of our program editors at the NATO Association of Canada, who's going to introduce our speakers uh, and start us off. Maria, thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our event discussing the challenges of global COVID-19 vaccine distribution, as Robert has already described. Um, my name is Maria Zelanova, and I am a program editor at the NATO Association of Canada. And today we are honored to be joined by three fantastic speakers, uh, Jim Townsend, Leona Alisleff, and Dr. Joy Fitzgibbon. Uh, thank you for joining us. To briefly introduce our speakers, um, Jim Townsend is an adjunct uh, senior fellow at the CNAS Transatlantic Security Program and was recently elected as president of the Atlantic Treaty Association. After eight years as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO policy, Jim Townsend completed more than two decades of work on European and NATO policy in the Pentagon at NATO and at the Atlantic Council. Through his work, he has helped execute US military engagement in almost every conflict from the Gulf War to the introduction of uh, US forces into Europe to deter Russia. He has also played critical roles in NATO enlargement, NATO reform, and helping to build bilateral defense relations with new democracies coming from the breakup of the Soviet Union. Before becoming DASD in 2009, Jim served as Vice President in the Atlantic Council of the United States and Director of the Council's Program on International Security. He joined the Atlantic Council in 2006 after a dis um, distinguished civil service career at the Pentagon and at NATO. In the 1990s, Jim was President Director, uh, Principal Director of the European and NATO Policy, the Director of NATO Policy, and the Director of the Defense Plans Division at the US Mission in, to NATO in Brussels, Belgium. Prior to working on Europe and NATO, Jim worked in foreign military sales at Defense Security Cooperation Agency as a country director for European Security Assistance and the assistant to the DSCA uh, Comptroller. Jim's early career also included work in the Department of State in the office of Congressman Charles Bennett and in the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. He was an adjunct professor of international studies at American University and has lectured in the US and overseas at universities, war colleges, think tanks, and at the Foreign Service Institute. He has also provided commentary to in, in the international press on TV, radio, and in newspapers. Leona Alisliff um, is our next speaker. She was first elected to the House of Commons in 2015 and was re-elected in 2019 as the member of parliament for Aurora Oak Ridges, uh, Richmond Hill in Ontario. After being elected in 2015, Leona was appointed as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Leona later served to, on the National Defense Committee, Foreign Affairs and International Development Committee, and the Citizenship and Immigration Committee, and was Chair of the Canadian NATO Parliamentary Association. In 2018, Leona was appointed Shadow Cabinet Minister for Global Security. 
In November 2019, Leona was appointed as deputy leader of the official opposition and shortly after named shadow cabinet minister for foreign affairs. She currently serves on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Special Committee on NATO, uh, on uh, Canada-China relations. Sorry, um, she's also a member of the Canadian NATO Parliamentary Association. Prior to serving as a member of Parliament, Leona was a Royal Canadian Air, For uh, Air Force officer, senior manager, and entrepreneur. Leona has held leadership positions in the Department of National Defence, as well as senior managerial roles with the IBM Canada and Bombardier Aerospace. She served on the Airspace Industry Association of Canada, the Ontario Airspace Council, and Women in Airspace Association Joint Government Industry Challenge, uh, Change Initiatives. She has also owned and operated two small businesses. Leo, Leona earned a BA uh, in History and Political Science from the Royal Military College of Canada in Kingston and received her Queen's Commission to serve as an Air Force Logistics Officer. She is fluent in both official languages, English and French, and has lived across Canada, but Leona now calls Oak Ridge as her home, where she has lived for the past 15 years with her husband, Ted, and her two children. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Joy Fitzgibbon uh, is our third speaker. She received her PhD from the University of Toronto. She currently serves as assistant professor and associate director of the Margaret Macmillan Trinity One program at Trinity College and as a fellow of college. Joy's re research con uh, considers the ways in which we respond more effectively and compassionately to human suffering in the hardest of places, focusing the solutions uh, to governance dilemmas in global health policy and on violence against women in conflict zones. In the Trinity One program, she is exploring the new modalities of pedagogy that enable us to learn, live, and serve our communities in integrated and sustainable ways. A recipient of Joint Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Canada Health Services Research Foundation grant for her doctoral research on Harvard's partners in health and its policy advocacy at the World Health Organization. She's also the co-author of Networks of Knowledge from Trinity uh, University of Toronto Press with Janice Stein, Richard Stern, and Melissa McLean. She has served uh, as a governance and policy advisor on the board of Food for the Hungry Canada, lectured as faculty in the International uh, Pediatric Emergency Medicine Elective and in the Canadian Disaster and Humanitarian Response Training Program, and submitted policy reports, uh, the then Canadian Center for Arms Control and Disarmament and the Canadian International Development Agency with uh, Janice Stein. She served on the University of Toronto's academic board and currently serves as Trinity College on the Senate as chair of the senior common room and as is a senior fellow at the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History. And after these lengthy introductions, I believe the speakers have prepared their opening remarks. Uh, so we will kick off the discussion with uh, Jim Townsend. Well, thank you, Maria, so much, uh, Robert, for this opportunity to, to take part in what is a very important panel uh, and a very important topic. Uh, and I also want to say, as an American here in, uh, in the United States, uh, how much I appreciate uh, working with my Canadian neighbors up to the north. I just, I think it's important for me to uh, say on a personal basis, uh, how much I have enjoyed uh, working with my Canadian colleagues over many decades and how important Canada is to us as a neighbor. Uh, we don't say that enough. Uh, and I just think that uh, we're one of the luckiest countries in the world to have you up in our north. So it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great uh, personal, uh, thing for me to be here with you all today. So thank you all. Um, so what I'm going to do just for a few minutes is talk about uh, the vaccination program and the rollout from a from the U.S. perspective. And so what does that mean? So I think I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons that we are learning about ourselves here in the United States as we roll out this vaccine. And also I want to talk a little bit about what is this? What have we learned about the United States? role internationally, trying to help the, the globe uh, as best we can as, as a superpower, uh, which, we, which comes with a great deal of responsibility. How are we really helping the rest of the globe in something like this? Uh, this is, you know, I can't think of another global uh, 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 challenge that I've seen in my lifetime, except perhaps climate change, where we're all in this together. Uh, and as, as a military planner and as in working in foreign and defense policy for so long, I've always wondered how it would be to have a global challenge like this. Usually when planners think about that, they think about an attack by the Martians or maybe it's an asteroid coming to the globe and you don't really have an opportunity to actually see something like this. And so for us, 
whether it's climate change, but particularly the a near term threat from something like the coronavirus is a global challenge that really smokes out in a lot of ways, how we as a global will react to something like that. And I think we're all learning a lot of lessons and there's still more lessons to come. Uh, but just uh, to look at the United States, uh, you know, it's, it is hard to, it's hard to talk about in just a short amount of time, all the lessons that we've learned about ourselves, whether it's our public health system, whether it's equity here in the United States and our race relations, uh, whether it is um, uh, presidential leadership, uh, what works and what does not. Uh, it, uh, our own form of government and how we can go about quickly coming together to deal with a challenge here in the United States of such a magnitude. We've learned a lot of things that have worked well. Um, we've learned a lot of things where we have got a lot of work to do in the next few generations in terms of dealing with inequity in our, in our, in our uh, social system and the way we deal with, uh, with um, poverty and the way we deal with those who uh, are not as uh, well off as uh, other parts of the US social structure here. I'll, sp I'll spare you all of that. I'm hardly an expert, but certainly I'm an observer of what we have seen and it breaks my heart. And, and, and I just want to acknowledge that we as a nation have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Um, but I'll say in just looking at the vaccine, I think, um, uh, and the public health aspects, we have learned, number one, that we have, we have underfunded public health in the United States. And I have to say, we've done that with our eyes wide open. It's not like this is some surprise. I think as cities and states, uh, as, uh, and as well as the national government, as we put together public health uh, uh, budgets and programs, we underfund them constantly. And now we're seeing the results of that. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that we learn this lesson, all these lessons that we will talk about. I hope that here in the United States, we learn that we cannot underfund something like investing in public health. That's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I think we have, we have learned that uh, there are very important parts of our, of our nation, of our people that are underserved by not just public health, but just our own, um, our own health system. I think we kind of know that. We've always had trouble uh, with our public health and, uh, and making sure everyone is adequately, uh, has adequate access uh, at as reasonable way, uh, as in a reasonable way in terms of payment to, to health, to health services. And as you know, we always look to Canada <laughs> and we always say we should be more like Canada. And then you get into this back and forth in American politics and it's terrible, but we do look towards Canada as showing how to, to deal with uh, ensuring public health uh, to all of its citizens. And we are learning once again, that we must deal with this. It's gotta be more than Obamacare. And there are stretches of the American society that are not getting this vaccine and are not served well because we're, there is still a misunderstanding and disinformation about what a vaccine does and whether there are health problems with that or not. And that comes from ignorance just among a lot of the American people on, on public health and vaccines and that type of thing. So we're having to start from scratch in convincing an important sector of the American society about the importance of the vaccine, what it does and what it does not. So we've learned about that as well. Uh, we've also learned about the importance of, uh, of presidential leadership, quite frankly. I think if you look back on the Trump administration time, you know, if you, you can say, certainly we we're all learning about this, this uh, with about this, uh, um, about COVID and about pandemics and how are we supposed to deal with pandemics? But I think what we're seeing right now, as you look at the administration of Donald Trump and you're looking at the administration of Joe Biden, there is one of, the, one of the major differences is how the White House and how our politicians deal with public health, leading by example, uh, trying to uh, focus on the science of things, understanding that science will change as we learn more about a pandemic. Uh, and that certainly in the other early stages of dealing with the pandemic with the Trump administration, our CDC um, and, our, and other aspects, NIH, other aspects of our public health system, we're learning about what we needed to do and trying to um, uh, preach that to the American people so that they wear masks, that they do social distancing, explaining why that's important. But for politics to get involved in that here in the United States was a big blow for handling the pandemic. And you're seeing that also as we 
get into the rollout of the vaccine and this type of thing here too. So, so again, the lesson learned about the important role of, of our politicians, the important role of the presidency, uh, and trying to keep politics out of a public health emergency and keeping science in. I think Dr. Fauci, I, I, you know, he lives in our neighborhood. And when I pass his house, I always salute because he certainly has remained a constant in this and certainly has helped us out. So those are some big lessons right there for us. There's many more. But, uh, but before I close, uh, I want to say that the role of the United States globally in this is, is absolutely essential. Um, Joe Biden has, uh, has put money towards uh, the COVAX uh, a program, billions into that. He's also um, has agreed with, uh, with Japan and with India, Australia, uh, to, for the partnership there to be putting uh, uh, vaccines into um, in Southeast Asia. The U.S. has been putting money into this and India will be manufacturing it, Australia doing the logistics. So uh, there's a role there for us too. Um, we could spend another two hours talking about uh, vaccine uh, nationalism. All of us have that uh, as, an, as an issue because uh, for the United States, you know, Joe Biden says we've got to take care of Americans first, but we are now really ramping up our production of the vaccines and we've got to get those out to the globe because we're not going to put this pandemic under control until we can have a global vaccination program and the United States must lead in this. Uh, we're sitting on AstraZeneca uh, doses, I think about 30 million uh, doses of that that we had ordered. I mean, there's, it's very complicated uh, trying, to, trying to discuss, uh, uh, particularly for the United States, when we'll be able to export, how we'll be able to do it. Um, but the importance is there. And I think I have, great, uh, I have great trust in the Biden administration to take this on as soon as we can. I think by the end of May, we're hoping to have enough doses for every American, then we must immediately uh, jump into exports and to, uh, to try to get uh, more money and more doses uh, out to nations that need it. So, um, so that's going on. We can talk about that more, but I won't take any more time. I want to turn to my Canadian colleagues uh, to give us their view as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Jim Townsend. Um, it's fascinating to hear from you and the American perspective. And I completely agree that this is a big lesson in keeping politics out of uh, global health crises and keeping the science in. Um, so next I would love to invite uh, Leona Alislev to deliver her opening remarks and uh, talk about the Canadian perspective. Well, thank you very much. And what an honor and a privilege to be on uh, such an incredible panel and to discuss such an important topic. Um, before I go into my the, the crux of my remarks, I would like to make sure that we don't forget all the people who have lost a loved one, who have been desperately ill, or who are suffering from a health perspective or just an economic perspective. There's no question that this crisis has had a physical, mental, economic, emotional toll that we have to bear in mind as we discuss everything going forward. So hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to everyone uh, who is finding it challenging in this time. And I'm hoping that uh, we will be out of this soon and that this panel will have some meaningful contribution to make to understanding just what we need to do next. So I thought I'd maybe start just a little bit with a, a definition of logistics, because everybody knows what logistics is, but yet no one really knows just how important it is and how broad it is. Um, it's a science and operations of dealing with procurement, supply, maintenance of equipment, with movement, evacuation, and hospitalization of personnel, with the provision of facilities and services, and everything related. So the real question is what isn't logistics. So when we're talking about logistics of vaccines or even logistics in pandemic, we can't look at it just in a narrow band. We have to look at it as the impact that it has on everything overall. And when Robert made his opening remarks, we are the NATO Association of Canada, and we're talking about why this matters in terms of security 
or our alliances. And I think we need to think about that too, certainly from a Canadian perspective. The global economic balance of power, both in terms of economies and security, has been changing. And while COVID is independent of that, it does have a significant impact on it. So how we get out of this, how we work with our allies during this, and what recovery and then the economic and security structure after this looks like is fundamentally something we need to be thinking about. And so Canada's response to our own crisis will be viewed by our allies and how well we do in terms of our own logistics, innovation and management will send a clear signal to our allies in terms of how much or how much they can't rely on us. So I think in terms of what we need to do and how we need to view things, we need to put that into perspective because Canada is not someone that can go it alone. Canada is a very proud uh, ally of NATO and other economic relationships, but we also need to understand that we have to hold up our own end of the bargain so that our allies can take us seriously and can depend on us. So let's talk a little bit then about how Canada has responded. And I want to preface it by saying that being able to take an honest and open perspective on what we've been successful at and what perhaps we haven't been doesn't make us unpatriotic. It makes us um, wise, I hope, and striving for excellence. So what, where were we? We didn't have when all of this started, the domestic capacity for personal protection equipment, for health support, for vaccines. We also have a national emergency plan that we didn't actually end up using. So we didn't then provide our Canadian public with a clear federal plan about what, where, when, how we would shut down the economy close our borders and deal with the health crisis. We didn't clearly define who had roles and responsibilities, how we were going to provide information. Now, our peers did. The US had a comprehensive plan. They put in place Operation Warp Speed six months ahead of us. The European Union had a plan. The UK had a plan. Australia had a plan. So why did Canada not have a plan? And did that have an impact on us? And we had stockpiles of, of safety equipment and personal protection that we found were outdated and therefore couldn't provide our population with some really important things that we needed at the time. Okay, so fast forward to now, where are we? Unfortunately, Canada is significantly behind our peers. We have the Americans vaccinated 3 million people in a day last week. Canada is still arriving at just over 3 million vaccinated in total. So while we're not the United States, percentage wise or per capita, we are not vaccinating at the same rate. The United States is forecasting to have vaccinated the majority of its population by June. We are not going to be able to achieve anything close to that. The numbers that are coming out of approximately a million vaccines a week, we don't know when that will start, but we still have over 30 million people to vaccinate. So if you're thinking two doses, that's 60 million doses that we still need. So if we're looking even optimistically at a million vaccines a week, that's at least 60 weeks before we can hit critical mass. That's almost in excess of a year from now and may be behind the United States and the UK. 
and all other of our alliance peers by almost a year. Okay, so why does that matter? Well, obviously we want to be able to look after the health and well-being of our citizens as quickly as possible, and vaccines are a critical piece in our ability to do that. So the most quickly that we can get the vaccines out, obviously the greater health outcomes for an entire Canadian public. But it's even more drastic than that because our health outcomes and our ability to get out of lockdown and open our borders have significant economic outcomes as well. Supply chains will move for where they're open. And so if we can't be open at the same time as our major economic partners or even our competitors, then we will lag and we will miss out. And that will not only affect our economy in recovery, it will affect it for the long term. We can't afford to miss that opportunity because we are essentially in a race of being able to open. So it also matters because it's a measure of confidence in Canada. How effectively, efficiently can we manage things? How is Canada able to adapt? How competitive are we? Are we able to produce and deliver and hold ourselves accountable to high standards? Are we able to innovate? There's no question that Canada is able to do all of those things, but in the last year, we haven't been able to do those on our best footing relative to our peers. We are lagging behind in vaccines. We are lagging behind in economic measures. We do have substantially more debt than relative to our peers. We don't have the domestic capability. We haven't been able to have some self-sufficiency in key areas. And we haven't been able to maneuver and pivot to effectively address relative art to our peers. That's going to have repercussions with the confidence that our allies put in us and obviously companies and corporations when they choose whether or not they want to do business here. So what do we have to do next? I would say, first and foremost, we kind of have to change the narrative. And I'm being a little harsh, I know, but you can't fix something if you don't agree that there's a problem. And if we're not comfortable arguing that there's a problem and that we should hold ourselves to a slightly higher standard, well, then we're not going to be able to do it. So we have to, in this country, change the narrative just a bit to say, hey, we need to do a bit better. And absolutely, positively, we have all of the ability and smarts and capability to be able to do better. Secondly, we do need to vigorously pivot and get in front of this. We have to start defining what the conditions will be to be able to open our economy. We have to actively work with the United States to understand what the conditions will be to be able to or open our border. That, that I'm not saying we need to open the border now, absolutely not. But I am saying that like a true logistician, time spent in planning is time saved. So we need to plan and our whole economy, society needs to understand what those metrics that we're trying to get to need to look like so that we know how to plan so that we're ready when the opportunity presents itself. We absolutely need a budget. That is the role of the federal government to set out the economic priorities and spending, especially in a crisis. Because again, by understanding what the government is prioritizing, then provinces can understand what they need to prioritize and regular citizens looking to restore their economic business livelihoods can also plan. So 
We absolutely need a budget and we need to start talking about vaccine infrastructure. Are we going to require pass vaccine passports or what does that look like? And will it actually be a Canadian decision or will it be an alliance decision that we will need to be part of so that we can ensure the free movement of goods and labor and citizens and travelers uh, throughout the alliance and, and the world. So in conclusion, we're not doing as well as we should be, and that's okay because we have the ability to, but we need to have a clear-eyed perspective on how we got here and what we need to do next. And we have to double down very quickly on getting out in front and understanding, communicating, defining roles and responsibilities, processes, what the plan looks like economically and from a health and security perspective. Because the consequences if we don't, unfortunately will be quite serious because the other countries are further ahead in a health perspective and an economic perspective. And the gap will be exponential if we can't rapidly catch up. So for the future economic security, as well as defense and security, and the strength of the relationship we have with our allies and how much they depend on us, now is our time. We can do it, but we have to do it quickly and stay focused. And this discussion today is one of the key things in making that happen. So again, thank you for having me and thank you to the NATO Association of Canada for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks. And um, uh, I think it's completely important to identify the problem before starting to come up with solutions. So thank you, Leona, you're uh, very correct in saying that this is an intertwined crisis and we can't begin to talk about economic recovery until we address uh, what went wrong in vaccine distribution and how it's going to be solved. Um, so last but not least, um, Dr. Joy Fitzgibbon, uh, I would love to hear your opening remarks as well on uh, the global health perspective from an academic standpoint. Thank you, thank you so much. And again, thank you, Robert and Maria. Robert, for your kind invitation. And Maria, for all of your uh, organization and coordinating uh, to arrange this uh, really wonderful panel. And I wanna thank specifically Jim and Leona for these beautiful, insightful, thought-provoking um, launches to our conversation today. Uh, as you could see a little bit from my bio, my area of expertise actually lies on the World Health Organization, and I look at multilateral partnerships in the context of their activity. So I think uh, listening to Jim and Leona, I'm going to pivot my comments really around that kind of contribution that we can be certainly making in Canada, but also the role um, of this multilateral kind of network structure. Uh, and what has gone wrong and where some of the challenges lie when we think about vaccine distribution. Uh, but to start off, you know, one of the things uh, for me as, the, as a scholar of global health policy and international politics, there's a real depth of frustration that we actually find ourselves in this space right now. Uh, in part because this pandemic was actually preventable in the sense that had we had better surveillance early on, uh, we could have actually prevented widespread death widespread suffering, severe economic loss, long standing impact on our health systems, which we all better prepare ourselves for because with long COVID, I'm anticipating that we're gonna see a lot of this manifest itself over time. And uh, Jim, you know, your comments about universal health care really resonated with me. And we have our challenges in Canada uh, in the midst of our system, which we're trying to work through. And if we think of that on a global scale, the requirements for primary care infrastructure, both for detecting these cases, for long-term provision of care, equitable care across the globe um, is, is serious. Uh, many of you will know that universal health care has been a, a key area of focus uh, at the global level for a, a, a recent, you know, maybe about seven or eight years uh, in global health. Um, and I think this does illustrate the importance of that. But just briefly, what went wrong? How did we get here? And I want to flag just a couple of things. Um, in my own research, I have been uh, kind of, uh, well, 
critical of the World Health Organization, but a critic as someone who believes in the organization. Okay, I want to be really clear on that. I'm not, I'm not bashing WHO. Um, in, one, in one respect, we are WHO, right? As members of the World Health Organization, we are in far, it is in fact a network of states. Of course, there's also bureaucratic structures in place, which many people like to point to, and there's certainly many cha challenges that the organization faces. So in this particular crisis, we have seen repeated challenges in this organization around you know, access to frontline knowledge, around bureaucratic structures and slow processes of decision making. And I could, and if this is something in the conversation people want me to comment on, I can talk a little bit about what might explain that slow rollout. And oh my goodness, I mean, some of us were honestly just tearing our hair out. Uh, and all of that is happening with a group of people who, by the way, are really determined um, to have an effective multilateral response. But I would respectfully suggest uh, that also Canada and the United States played a role in um, missing this. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, our, our friends to the south, Jim, uh, Centers for Disease Control, have had a, a challenging time uh, this last uh, multiple years, and certainly even uh, before the last administration, but it certainly intensified, I think, during the administration. And the, the politicization of science through the CDC was deeply harmful. Uh, and there was a whole range of, you know, credibility issues that came up, even, I think, with the, the initial testing uh, challenges that were faced. And I'm really quite heartened at the changes that we're seeing taking place at the CDC already under the new administration with a really capable leader, uh, from what I understand, at the CDC. But we have relied upon the CDC for global surveillance and ongoing surveillance of pandemics. They're uh, an essential global partner and have been um, through all pandemics. But many people probably are unaware of Canada's um, Global Public Health Intelligence Network, which sits in, um, in Public Health Canada. And this, for, for members of our audience who are not familiar with this, just briefly, um, it's based on open source intelligence. So it's a group of scientific detectives who basically comb the globe in an effort to uh, detect outbreaks that would not be announced by governments that are not publicly expressed uh, through official channels. And they play an important role in surveillance and ongoing surveillance of pandemics, i.e. right now, including new strains, for example, of a pandemic that could be emerging. Uh, and for a variety of complicated reasons, GPEN uh, was not, let's just say, empowered to issue the kind of alerts that they would normally issue. WHO uh, has partnered with Canada and with GPEN. We provided at one point 20 percent of the global intelligence on pandemic um, detection. OK, but we missed this. OK, we did not have an alert sent out in time. And there's a series of complex reasons why that may have taken place. I'm actually doing some ongoing research on that right now. But what are the, what's the take home from this? Well, the take home from this, if you look at a recent report on pandemic preparedness that's coming out of WHO, or it's an external assessment of WHO, uh, and they, did, they issued an interim apart report. I'm waiting for the final report. But one of the things they mentioned was that WHO essentially was being asked to do things they weren't equipped to do. And one of the conclusions that they came was that they're so dependent upon countries like the United States, like Canada, and like many others uh, for that early detection of these kinds of pandemics. And I think it speaks to the importance of these multilateral partnerships through UN agencies. And particularly as if we think of the capacity in NATO and the NATO allies, the scientific capacity that we have, like the heft is huge. I mean, I'm, I'm part of one university, right? That does groundbreaking work. But if you think of the universities across Canada, across the United States, across all of our NATO uh, allies, the, the intellectual heft that's there is essential for WHO success and for the networks around pandemic preparedness. And I would argue also for the science involved in the vaccine rollout. So I defer Leona to your um, known expertise on logistics. I, will <laughs> I, I read your bio and thought, oh, this is gonna be really interesting. Um, and, but you know, behind that then the science of this. So you know, what are some of the challenges that we're, that we're facing uh, in terms of, uh, of that? Well, you know, we can talk if, if people want about the vaccine nationalism. And I mean, that's, that's uh, I think, uh, Jim, you were making the point. It, it's people will be looking after their own citizens. This is going to happen. We, we know that, right? And Canada, I think, Leona, we're in a terrible position. I agree completely with what you said. I think we're in an awful position in part because um, we've committed financially quite a bit to COVAX, right? And, you know, for listeners who maybe haven't been following every detail, COVAX is this global network, right? It's a partnership between WHO, UNICEF, Gavi, and CEPI, these, uh, CEPI being a, a global network around pandemic uh, preparedness. And these are, and Gavi, this global vaccine initiative. This is a truly new form of kind of global collaboration. We've seen some iterations of this before. 
really promising, really interesting, incredible opportunities, I think, for NATO allies to play vital roles in this. Um, but one of our challenges in Canada is we don't have, obviously, we have a, it's like we have a cash flow problem, we have a vaccine flow problem, you know, the logistics is a disaster. My dad's about to leave right, my house right now. I live with my 83 year old dad, and he's about to get vaccinated. Um, but I know so many people who can't even get on, right? So we have that challenge. So we've given a financial uh, boost to, to COVAX, uh, but we, of course, have bought way more vaccines than we actually need for our population. And when we look at global distribution, uh, that's a problem, right? But as Dr. Peter Singer pointed out recently from the WHO, um, yeah, but you know, you, you can't give stuff you don't have. So this is, I think this, this, this really reinforces, Leona, what you were saying in the sense that unless you have your rollout smoothly, it really, it's hard for you to be a good partner globally, right? So we think we, you know, I'm, I'm being a little bit hard on Canada and I'm going to be as kind as I love my Canadians and I love, you know, I, there's and in all parties, there are people of good faith here. So I'm, but you know, the challenge is we've, you know, we failed on our detection. We, we could have, we were the one people, one group of people that might've been able to, to spot this and say, Hey, stop this because you know, the information is not being, rele being released by China. Okay. And then now we're failing on this on this uh, actually being able to do all that we could in that vaccine rollout. And you know, watching with awe in the states, seeing that 18 year olds are being vaccinated in some of your states right now. I mean, this is incredible, Jim. So, and in other countries of the world as well. So, you know, that that's a, a huge lesson for us as well. I think there's other big issues that might be worth having a conversation about where US leadership and Canadian leadership might be important and just broader leadership of NATO allied countries around intellectual property in vaccines. I know this is controversial and it's a difficult topic, um, but there's been, you know, a couple of conversations regarding COVAX in terms of, you know, they are providing concessional pricing. There's been one suggestion that perhaps, you know, higher pricing right now, but then quickly have those prices drop so that lower income communities can actually be, have access to uh, sufficient numbers to actually have herd immunity in, in their, their countries. But then we also have the challenge around, you know, some of the calls of, to suspend WTO uh, regulations around patents right now. That has gained no, absolutely no traction with any of the vaccine uh, manufacturers as of yet. Uh, but these are important issues. You have people like, you know, Bill Gates who are, are raising that issue. Uh, and so, you know, again, Canada could be playing a role on this. Canada has not stepped up and made a statement about that. They have not come behind those, those uh, decisions. So, um, you know, it, 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 we cannot do this alone. I agree. It is one of those issues where in Canada, um, we need to learn quickly, I think globally um, around multilateralism and institutions that learn. Uh, if there's one thing that this particular pandemic should teach all of us is that we have to be able to pivot quickly. And we have to be able and to do that, you know, to your point, Leona, we have to, we do have to plan, right, nationally, but we also do that, have to do that globally, I think, too. And I have a sense that, you know, COVAX is amazing. You have WHO that is, um, you know, really trying to champion this and, and sort of doing the global, uh, the global tour to try to push this, but they cannot do that alone. And um, if we, if we are not willing to look honestly at where things have gone wrong globally, uh, look at other initiatives like, you know, even if we look at the Global Drug Fund for HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, this is another collaborative distribution mechanism, right? Learn some of the lessons from positive experiences there and negative, applying this to vaccine rollout with COVAX. That did involve some suspension of some patent regulations and intellectual property regulations. This is, this is, a, this is a crisis, frankly. And my big concern is that we are not going to to, to um, be able to keep up uh, in terms of distribution with vaccines. We will not be able to keep up to the new strains, the variants um, in time. And if that happens, I mean, we got off easy. This was a relatively easy pandemic to manage. It didn't kill people quickly. It didn't kill large portions of people. This is not the nightmare scenario that most public people, public health people have. If that, if this turns into a version of that nightmare scenario, because we were slow on our vaccine rollout. Um, you know, all of the progress that we've made uh, will be for naught, including, you know, Jim in, in the US, right? If you can imagine if we have a particularly aggressive strain. So in addition for future pandemics, which is perhaps an entirely other uh, conversation, uh, for this one alone, we're on a knife's edge right now of losing the, pro the progress of these vaccines and how long that will take before we would have new strains that would, would morph into something that would be resistant uh, to uh, the, the widespread range of vaccines that we have already? I don't know. I don't think that there's scientific agreement on that, but there's an agreement that that is possible. And so the sooner we pay attention to the need for political collaboration and efficient rollout, 
I would also add just in it, this really does dovetail Jim with your comment about the importance of what I would call the blunt force tools versus the precision tools. So those really strong public health measures um, when we look around the world globally about what works, you know, case detection, contact tracing, masking, uh, isolation of positive cases, um, ventilation, good grief, we're way behind on that in Canada. We're way behind on that, I think, in a lot of countries. Who got that fast? Japan. In February of last year, Japan was dealing with ventilation. We haven't even still been talking about it. So that has to come alongside vaccine rollout because contact tracing is actually part of that. I mean, Ontario, we've just given up contact tracing in many, many provinces and country, but just not even contact tracing anymore, really. So, you know, this is a problem. Uh, and I think we have to see, you know, tried and true blunt forth public health tools with these precision vaccines. And we've got to ramp this up fast and we've got to wrap it up equitably. You know, I'll, I'll close with two comments from actually Peter Singer, whom I had a lovely conversation with the other day, but he said two things that really struck with me, struck, struck me. One, COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere. Some of us have probably heard that. We're one plane right away, as they say. But secondly, he talked about in an article that he published, leadership as the great vaccine. <laughs> and I think, you know, Jim, this ties in with your comment as well, the power of leadership. And I would argue that we need that at the global level right now. And I would like to see our governments, you know, at the senior levels collaborating in such a way uh, where there can be some consensus on some pretty radical action. Uh, for COVAX in order to ensure that equitable distribution. Because if we don't, I, I think, you know, if we look at past pandemics that were uh, not as comprehensive in terms of their distribution as this one, um, this will come back and hit us. And to your point, Leona, it's going to be a long time of recovery, certainly for Canada, but for many other countries as well, because the progress that has been made will be undone. So um, I could go on talking, but I'll stop there because I think it probably would be far more interesting to hear people's questions and to talk uh, with my colleagues on this panel. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fitzgibbon. That was a fascinating opening as well. And uh, I think definitely we can agree that this is the fire drill before the fire. And uh, uh, we can only hope that this fire drill uh, teaches us some very important lessons on how to avoid um, tragic outcomes in uh, a situation where a virus is much more dangerous and spreading at a faster pace and killing more people. So we can only hope that we take these lessons and move into the future on how to prevent further pandemics. Um, so we do have some moderated questions prepared to kick off the discussion. And um, our first question is, how can skepticism around the vaccine from the public derail vaccination efforts? Is the anti-vax movement a significant concern? And if so, what can governments do to increase public trust in the vaccines, uh, especially with a lot of uh, news coverage surrounding AstraZeneca vaccine and uh, some reports that it may be dangerous for some age groups uh, recently? And uh, I guess anyone uh, can start, so. Jim Townsend, yeah. I'll, I'll jump in uh, on that. Just uh, sometimes I think the anti-vax started here in the US. So maybe that's my responsibility is to say, uh, you know, how are we gonna deal with this? Um, you know, the, uh, there's, there certainly is a core, I'm just from the US, just starting off looking at this from a US perspective, there's always been a core anti-vaxxer group uh, in the US and, uh, you know, and it's also become, and perhaps it started off this way, but it certainly has become politicized as well, uh, which we won't even get into all the US domestic politics or uh, where, where that that is part of. Um, and so there's gonna be this core that I'm not sure anyone can convince one way or another. I think we have to try. I don't think we just write them off, but I think, I think so much of the effort is gonna to have to be um, a, a, certainly the states and the local localities, but it's got to be led by the national government. Again, um, like Dr. Fitzgibbon has been saying, it goes back to the a national uh, effort led by the politicians. It's got to be something that's, um, that's, that both sides of the aisle are going to have to come together on to make an effort on a national basis to lead the states, to lead the localities, uh, to deal with this sentiment as it as it pertains to the uh, um, as it pertains to the this this pandemic. Um, I think we can make great progress with a lot of those who aren't anti-vaxxers as much as they're just hesitant. Uh, there's a hesitant group uh, that is just scared, uh, and I think I think the, the you can deal with that through education. 
You can deal with that by going house to house. Uh, you can deal with that by using social media. You can deal with that in having um, sports stars and other public figures talk about uh, this, the importance of this and showing by their example. And again, uh, Dr. Fitzgibbon, going back to the idea that uh, um, the, the national leadership by their example can help to, to deal with this. That's why having Donald Trump uh, not take part in a public way of being vaccinated was a blow, a blow to, to dealing with this, this uh, pandemic here in the United States. Uh, he has such sway over this 30 or 35 percent of his core here by having a picture of him getting getting the vaccine would have done a lot. It comes down to to national leadership. It comes down to national personalities. It comes down to education uh, and it comes down to local people, um, uh, local health officials, local politicians, local activists almost going door to door. Uh, to uh, to try to talk to people and to get them vaccinated. It has to be done. We'll never reach herd, uh, the herd immunity if we don't do something along those lines. Um, I've talked to uh, uh, a lot of doctor friends of mine. Uh, Dr. Waltrip uh, is one of them that I talked to in Texas who has talked so much about this local effort. Uh, and I think she's absolutely, I think Laura is absolutely right on this. And I think it's something that um, we're going to have to see in other cities as well as the local health officials leading a local effort supported by the national government leading by example. If I could perhaps uh, jump in, I think uh, I agree, of course, completely with everything uh, Jim's just said. I would also add that this is a symptom of a bigger problem. We uh, have to figure out how to be able to have a conversation about truth. And I know that's a delicate topic, so I'll be very careful, but we have to value experts uh, over the narrative that's getting perpetuated. And we collectively as democracies are going to have to figure out how to be able to communicate real and valid information to our citizens because a democracy is only as good as the information that our citizens have to make informed decisions. So where we have 90% or some people getting 90% of their information from Facebook and Facebook and other social media out, um, applications having algorithms that only feed certain information to them because it's the information that that individual wants to consume. We have great swaths of our population who are able to live within what I would argue is an almost an alternate truth or fact or imbalanced information environment. We cannot allow that to happen because it will erode uh, our democracy, which of course is so foundational. So I think we do need to have a bigger conversation about how we get there, because as we've seen, for something as critical as vaccines, it affects the health and well-being of our population, as well as the economic future and prosperity for generations to come. So and and there are other things that misinformation is uh, being perpetuated that has maybe not as serious, but certainly serious consequences. So it's almost a symptom of a bigger problem. So we actually have to address certainly the symptom when we need people to, to have confidence in the vaccines, but we need to get to a point where we as society can differentiate between uh, experts and be able to have that clear quality of information for our citizens. Yes, if I can just build on that too, uh, Leona, thank you, uh, and Jim as well. I, I see um, a, an ongoing challenge there of kind of crossing that bridge, right? From the scholarly space, even being able to speak in English <laughs> to people, uh, you know, about why should they believe what you know scientists would have to say on on a vaccine and on the risks of a vaccine and all of that. And so, how do we establish credible relationships? 
Um, it seems to me, I'm thinking of that community health response, Jim, that your comments, I think, are moving in the direction of as well. Having a strong infrastructure in each one of our countries of community health providers, not only doctors and nurses, but well, not only doctors and primary care physicians, but nurses and, and other community health workers, they can actually go out in an incredible way, explain to people in very accessible language, um, you know, the science behind vaccines, why it works, where there are gaps, where there are uncertainties, like be transparent, be honest, right? And what the scientific process is about as well. Um, I don't think we have the infrastructure, certainly in Canada, we used to maybe have one, uh, but we don't now. If you look at many lower income countries who have limited um, numbers of doctors, for example, they actually flourish with the presence of community health workers. So you have a country like Rwanda, for example, that has a pretty good distribution of community health workers. They've actually been using those in pandemic control for a long time. So there are some really important implications for us. Um, you know, we in Canada, we, used to, we still have Victorian order of nurses, uh, right? But these people who will go to your home, right? And have these conversations. Um, but I think there's a larger question in the media as well around how we talk about this. Uh, and you know the role of experts in the language that we use, but also um, how we frame conversations about what is reliable and what is not reliable, what is true and what is not true, and where where is the area we don't know. Be explicit about the ranges of uncertainty in our data. Be explicit about the ranges, those areas that are gray versus those areas that are black and white. And you know that includes in our universities when I teach a class. <laughs> okay, so I, I have to. Not everything is just perception. There are realities out there. So just because I can't measure precisely the number of people right now that have COVID doesn't mean they don't exist, right? So being able to, to really speak in language like that, that's accessible. And that's a, that's a, I agree, a much larger project, both in terms of the structural as well as the, you know, the narrative. Thank you so much to everyone. Yeah, and I agree, this is almost like a great marketing challenge, you know, perhaps having someone like Beyonce publicly receive her vaccine and post about it on social media would be helpful towards this uh, goal as well. But uh, there are many, many solutions here. Uh, and I would just like to remind everyone watching that uh, you're welcome to ask a question in our live chat on uh, YouTube as well. And we will definitely get to them um, after a couple more moderated questions. So our next moderated question is, uh, it's a little bit longer. Uh, Russia produced a viable COVID-19 vaccine, and there are very valid concerns about skipping crucial steps in the testing process, uh, but Western peer-reviewed journals have confirmed that the vaccine is safe and effective against the virus. Uh, but due to difficult uh, dif uh, history and strained relations between Russia and Western countries, it is very unlikely that Western leaders will consider working with Russia to secure any of those vaccines for their own citizens. So the question is, should Canada and the US attempt to work with Russia on delivering the vaccine for their own citizens as well? And more broadly, what steps can be taken to reach cooperation with a traditionally adversary country in light of a common threat and a common goal in the future? Well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll jump on that one as well. It, it's, it's, you know, I think um, a couple of things, just to say that uh, there, there are some European uh, nations that are using Sputnik V uh, or Sputnik V, I'm not sure which is properly, uh, what's properly called, but I think there are some governments uh, in Europe that are having to turn to use that Russian vaccine because they don't have enough on their own coming out of the EU and which is a whole other story, the EU rollout. And so they're having to use that. And I think other nations around the world too. So it is it's it is definitely being used. Um, uh, the secondly, I think Russia, there is this, this thing where we understand that Russia is beginning to use its disinformation to undercut the uh, effectiveness of other vaccines, et cetera. You know, in a crisis like this, there is no room for that kind of, of activity by anyone. Uh, I think to go to directly to your question, at a time like this, we have got to bend over backwards to work with everyone. We've got to let science take the lead. If, if, the, if the Russians can produce a vaccine uh, and they can do it to a standard that we can all accept, uh, and uh, then we need to be able to use that around the world. The same thing with the Chinese. This is not a time for us to allow adversarial relations, to allow politics. Um, to use um, the weaknesses in other nations in terms of their own rollouts, to use it against them. 
Uh, I guess it's human nature. It's the nature of, of nations. And I'm sounding very idealistic right now and very, as we would say in the US, very much a Pollyanna approach. But we've got to take a lesson from this that, um, that we have got to pull together. And we've got to let our worst, we have to prevent our worst instincts from coming to the fore as best we can. I don't think we'll ever be completely um, uh, successful that way. This is gonna happen. We've got to defend ourselves too against disinformation and this type of thing. Um, but I think we have got to try as best we can to set aside these adversarial uh, relationships and try to work together. Uh, we have to at least give it a shot. We've got to try uh, our, in the first instance. We're gonna have to try uh, to, um, to work together this way. I think the WHO, can certainly help in this way, but the WHO, uh, as Dr. Fitzgibbon, I think who has worked with the WHO, you know, the US pulled out of it. Uh, there was talk about the Chinese influence being too much within the WHO in years past. I mean, there's the politics is, is everywhere, but I think we have to strive towards um, science. We have to let science uh, lead us. We have to uh, figure out how we can best use vaccines that come from any source, as long as they are proven. Uh, and we have to help in the logistics of it. Uh, and uh, I think we have to uh, let science be the lead and try to hold back the devil on our shoulder as best we can and appeal to the angel on the other side to work together in this pandemic. I agree completely with the idealism uh, that he has just, uh, that Jim has just uh, brought to us. But I, I also believe we have to be pragmatic. And the pragmatic conversation is we have, unfortunately, a fair number of people who don't trust the vaccine that we've developed, uh, and we Western medicine with all of our health uh, regulatory structures and all of that kind of stuff. And so ultimately, it does boil down to trust and confidence. And so the possible gap between where citizens are in trusting uh, a vaccine that would come from countries that perhaps we don't trust as much as other countries, I think we have to take that into consideration. Now, does that mean that we can't find a way to boost up that trust meter? Absolutely. Perhaps we bring the vaccine here and we have a partnered clinical trial that is done by Canadian pharmaceutical or American pharmaceutical or, or whatever, um, I think that that's absolutely possible and it should be something we should be striving for. But I think that we are facing our own credibility issues with some of the existing vaccines that we currently have that we need to overcome as we just discussed in the last question. So we have to be very careful that we don't undermine that process while at the same time, yes, trying to get to a point where we can see a virus as being a uniting uh, and common enemy for want of a better term for the globe uh, and let the better angels uh, guide us in that. Thank you. I mean, you're actually making, I, I think a, a case for early on more collaborative global partnerships around vaccine development. I, I just wonder if that would be, you know, right now, of course, as, as we're all saying, we're playing catch up ball. Um, I feel like we're like eight months to a year behind, but if, if we could be in the future out ahead of this, where, you know, there, there's a great literature actually on using scientific partnerships to promote peace building, to promote collaboration, even, you know, across the lines, uh, the political lines that are there. And maybe that's one of the lessons we can draw from this is how we can set up those, those structures in the future. My colleagues over at the Faculty of Medicine at U of T, they do these global partnerships all the time and we know it's there. And so, yeah, precautions have to be put in place for obvious reasons, but, um, you know, when, when tensions run high, as one of my professors, Franklin Griffiths used to say, the last thing you should do is cancel academic exchanges and partnerships. The first thing you should do is in fact build on those in order to try to have a foundation for collaboration um, when it's politically possible to do so. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think it's definitely very valid, uh, very valid answers and uh, you know uh, 
there is a lot of reason to be wary about working with countries like that have been traditionally adversary to us. Uh, but in a time like this, we can only hope that more cooperation can be achieved in the future. Uh, so um, I would like to remind uh, all our participants that they're welcome to ask questions on the YouTube chat. And I think in the interest of time, we're now going to take some of those to make sure that we also get uh, questions from the audience in as well. So our first question is, how can NATO contribute to vaccine procurement and distribution in its member countries? Oh, I'll, I'll jump on that hand grenade as well. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's a great question, and it's something that uh, that NATO is wrestling with right now. In, in other words, it's it's trying to figure out what's the, what's what kind of role can NATO play uh, with this kind of threat. And it's it's fascinating too because uh, I've worked with NATO for many years, and uh, the threats uh, that we uh, and the alliance have been planning for, and and. And, and, and assuming could, would, could be in our future, certainly are on the military side. So uh, we talk about defense spending, we talk about uh, weapons procurement, we talk about uh, interoperability, uh, if we talk about what the, what's, the, what's the future military flight look like. Well, right now, I think the pandemic has opened the eyes to the allies and to NATO uh, as an institution that NATO has got a role in a in security that's not a, um, a a focused on the military side, and it was a bit of a surprise. But NATO quickly, I'll give NATO credit. Within the first few months of the pandemic last year, uh, they began to use NATO uh, authorities and NATO um, assets uh, to work with allies to move to fly patients uh, from one country to another, to fly equipment, uh, to have a common purchasing pool or purchasing capability where allies can come together at NATO and jointly purchase mil medic medical equipment, things like that. Um, so early on, it showed that it, it does have a role to play and it can play it and it did it pretty quickly. And I think now as we have learned so much from this pandemic, I think the idea that NATO can do more than that um, is, is on everyone's minds. And as I was thinking about it uh, just over the past few hours, getting ready for this, you can see a time where a, an ally or a partner or, or any nation can turn to the Alliance and say, um, you know, we don't have, I'm gonna make this up, but we don't have a national guard. We don't have a national ability to mobilize and quickly inject um, our citizens. Could you help us, you NATO help us do this? Uh, and so I could see how NATO could put together a non-Article 5 uh, mission where you would have allied contributions to a NATO pool of, of doctors or other medical personnel that would go off to a partner country or go off to, again, even a non-partner country and help that nation inoculate and help that nation, um, you know, help uh, shore up their, uh, their public health system uh, to, to, to handle this emergency. I could see that happening um, because at the end of the day, uh, we have to have everyone inoculated. We can't sit back and say, well, NATO is only gonna help allies. So I think NATO can play a role. I think NATO should play a role. And I will be willing to bet you uh, over the next year, you will see a, uh, a formal attempt at NATO to define the kind of role that NATO can play in a health crisis like this and acquire the capability, NATO itself as an institution, acquire the capability, uh, maybe it's stockpiles of PPE, maybe it is a uh, reserve corps of medical personnel within the Alliance that can be deployed on these kinds of missions. I we willing to bet you, you might see that. Uh, and I think that would be a great thing. That's a fascinating um, observation, Jim. Thank you. I, you know, as you were talking, it reminded me of you know, the role of these other, uh, of, of international institutions in their kind of, the, the particular gifts that they bring, the, the, you know, the, they have a corner on the market of something in terms of skills as well. So, I mean, you saw the G7 as a kind of catalytic force for the Global Fund for TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. And, you know, they don't, they don't follow through the delivery of stuff, right? They're kind of catalytic. That's, I think that's one of the big contributions. They can be creatively catalytic. NATO with the strength and logistics and delivery and provision, huge, huge resource, huge asset. And it's funny because it's one of those things that everybody imagines WHO has this capacity. I think they saw some Hollywood film sometime, somewhere, outbreak or something, where there's like, you know, this, these, this global force that can come in and do miracles. And of course they don't have any of that. And you're, you're get, causing me to think that perhaps that is um, NATO can fill that space globally because we need actually do need that. 
dramatically need that, seriously. And I'm gonna echo exactly what they've said because absolutely, the beauty of NATO is that we have a structure. We have a structure, we have processes, we have roles and responsibility, ultimately logistics is founded on all of that. And so there's, yes, the cost of doing that, but the benefit would be even more than the actual mission that we're looking at. So in this case, the benefit would be way more than just vaccines. Because ultimately, the more that we have mechanisms to talk to people and develop relationships and share experiences and expertise, the more that we have global security. So I know that sounds a little bit on the idealistic side, but ultimately, that's the next generation of where we need to be. We used to have more interactions in the world, even Canada. We used to have more diplomats. We used to have more military on NATO missions, peacekeeping operations around the world. Systematically, over the last 20 years, we have withdrawn all of that. And we have much less reporters, military, diplomats, trade, much fewer just people going to countries all over the world. Has that had an impact on our understanding, our relationships and our collaboration? I don't know, it's probably something hard to measure, but my gut says it couldn't possibly not have. So while this is a devastating situation for our globe to be in, let's look at this as the opportunity to re-engage with the capabilities, strengths, communications, collaboration and relationships on the world stage. Well, Thank there's, you. There's gonna be a NATO summit uh, in June and I think the Canadian government would do well to attend that summit and suggest, uh, have your prime minister suggest that, uh, that this is something that NATO should do. It could be a Canadian initiative suggested there at NATO. And I think that would be a, a great feather in the cap uh, for the Canadian uh, government. Thank you so much for your comments. And um, our next question from the chat is, uh, do you foresee Canada making personal protective equipment a national security issue in the future, as in ensuring that a certain amount, amount of PPE or pharmaceuticals are manufactured in Canada to avoid shortages, um, as has been seen in the beginning of the pandemic? So I'd like to jump in on that one and say, absolutely. Globalization, integrated supply chains, trading relationships with the world, fundamentally important. So not saying that we want to in any way retreat from that perspective. However, we have a responsibility for some critical things to make sure that we can look after our own population. Because we can't help looking after anybody else's population if we can't look after our own population. So the sooner that we can have some critical self-sufficiency in certain areas to be able to look after ourselves, then we can more quickly be able to provide surplus capacity and support to those who may not have the ability to get there. And so this is around our own resilience. I, I think one of the major lessons of this whole pandemic has to be to show us that capability that we used to have, um, pharmaceutical, medical, personal protective equipment, even some energy security and other things that come with it, we don't have those capabilities now. And it has affected our ability to respond. We don't have any surplus capacity. Our hospitals and all of these things are right, right down to the wire so that when a blip or a crisis comes, we're like strapped. So I think that we do need to think of how we can do that. And so if we don't need the surplus capacity because we're in a crisis, then we have surplus capacity to be able to contribute to the world that will help us because by helping the world, again, back to developing those relationships and, and, and broadening our trade, economic, intellectual, collaborative relationships, there's no downside. It looks after our citizens, gives us the ability to withstand a crisis and 
allows us to be good global citizens, which is a very significant Canadian value and one that we need to put a little more focus into, I think. Thank you. Anyone else? I would like to tackle this question or we can move on to the next one uh, in the interest of time. Um, okay, we're gonna... Our next question from the chat is, to what extent must China be held accountable for its negligence at the start of the pandemic and its refusal to cooperate with the WHO investigations into the origins of the virus? Well, I'll just wade into that, jump on that grenade. Um, I mean, the data is emerging in pieces uh, coming out of the public health community, but it is clear that uh, this, this virus was around for quite some time before uh, it was leaked to the press in, in, um, in Wuhan. Um, I know there are a number of reports coming out now, including one study that suggests that even Canada, we probably had it two months, at least two months before um, the first official case in January. So if we back this up, uh, it's quite likely that you know it was in Wuhan or other areas of China. We're not quite sure. Uh, you know, several months before. Okay, so uh, and there were always challenges of case detection to be sure, but it's quite clear that when you have pneumonia outbreaks of unknown origin, that immediately the hair on the back of the neck stands up of anybody who studies pandemics. So when I saw that on December 31st, I looked at it and went, oh no, is this it? Is this the thing we've been worried about? I mean, that was my immediate response. And of course it became pretty clear pretty quickly that it was. Um, and most of us uh, looking at China's response uh, would say, you know, they, they needed to satisfy their requirements to the World Health Organization through international health regulations by reporting earlier, by being more transparent. That is what it is. Um, the data shows that in fact, they could have prevented the spread uh, outside the country. I, I'm, I will get the numbers uh, slightly wrong, but it's something like 36, 68, and I think it was 82%, depending on the number of days they had, they had actually used blunt force public health instruments uh, in, across the country. And in the time that it took them to put some of those provisions in place, the, the virus had already spread outside the country. So there was actually global impact on, uh, as a result of their failure to act. And this is, this is now being confirmed through scientific research. When we say to what extent should they be held accountable? Well, what does one mean about that politically? How does one hold a country like China accountable? What are the tools, right? And I, I'm, I'm echoing back um, to Jim's, your comment about the need for everybody to be at this point collaborating uh, because we basically now have a global crisis and yet people do have to be called out, right? And how do you do that diplomatically? Uh, and I'm not a diplomatic, uh, I'm not an expert on diplomacy, um, but what I would say is that truth has to be told here. And it is coming out. Um, the origins of this will come out. <laughs> okay, uh, China will not be able to suppress that. We will get to it. Will we get to the full story because of some of the, you know, some of the the challenges? Probably not every part of the story. Researchers will not be able to get to every part, but I think we will have a good idea. Um, and I, I do think that there needs to be a really serious conversation at the World Health Organization around what what you do when countries are not cooperative, <laughs> frankly, uh, and how how that should be handled diplomatically and. On on a, on a sort of public platform. Um, and I'm not suggesting necessarily, and maybe I should be, but I'm not suggesting dramatic, sorry, I've got a, uh, an emergency note coming in here from my dad getting a vaccine. Um, <laughs> but I'm not suggesting a dramatic, um, you know, people will say, should they be sanctioned? Should they be, well, I don't know. Should she should, should really go that route? That's a conversation to have at WHO. I don't think so, but I do think we need to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. And there needs to be tighter checks coming through the surveillance process and the revealing of of the um, of uh, the the ongoing information regarding the the virus uh, and WHO needs to be putting those checks in place and there can be you know public shaming I think there's a place for that <laughs> I'm just being blunt uh, again this is back to a truth-based and science-based uh, international order you know I think at a minimum we have to be able to learn from this that whether it's China or another nation where this might start and they'll and you know, they'll use their own tactics to try to hide things or whatever it might be. I mean, again, we're dealing with human nature. China seems to have taken that to a high plateau uh, in terms of hiding things. But I think we, well, one of the things that we have to take away from this is how do we protect the system? How do we protect ourselves? Uh, and part of that is having a uh, 
you know, we've got to figure who's who's watching the watchers in a sense. You know, how can we account for this? And I think uh, we can certainly come up with bureaucratic ways to do it. But I think in a sense, this is where, again, science is going to have to play a big role. It's going to have to be science watching, too. And as science begins to pick up the idea that there's something going on, whether it's China or elsewhere, there's something going on there. They've got to be, got, got to be able to call that out. Again, we don't want to jump on every rumor and, and jump on uh, and have a lot of, of mistakes and missed calls. But I think we can't take for granted that the WHO is going to be able to sound the alarm or that a nation will do the right thing at the very beginning. We have to learn from this that that's not going to happen, probably, that we will not see a nation that will uh, raise its hand and say, we've got a big problem here. We're doing our best to, to deal with it, but want to let you guys know. That's just not human nature, and it's just not what nations are going to do, and we can't depend on the WHO being the one to, to detect it up front um, and to sound the alarm. I think, it's, it's, uh, I, think, I think science and the scientists and the health professionals will be the first ones to get an indication something's happening, uh, and I think they have got to help uh, to notify their own uh, health system there, whether it's in Canada or the US or other places, that something's going on and that we've got to quickly take a look at this and, and begin to try to deal with it. We can't assume nations are going to do the right thing. We can't assume the WHO will be able to uh, sound the alarm at the right moment. This is going to be a collective effort to keep an eye out for this kind of outbreak and to quickly make that uh, known to governments to begin to do something about it. Yeah, just to, to uh, bounce back on that, Jim, I that actually, I think, too, there was a scientist coming out of Wuhan, right, who were actually sounding the alarm, and they had great personal cost. But again, this is back, Leona, to the role of the Canadian government, where I really feel that the GPN network could have done exactly what you're saying. And I, I think we need more investment in that kind of scientific infrastructure, maybe linked with our governments, but also, in some cases, they have to be because of their access to information. Um, but we need leadership in that space and developing that concept of open source intelligence that kind of tries to serve, you know, sneak around, frankly, the official channels in order to detect people who are either don't have the capacity or who are frankly lying. <laughs> And I couldn't agree with you more. We had it and then we got rid of it. And I, I, I can't for the life of me personally understand why we would have done that. And, and that's why when I mentioned that there was a bunch of things that we had that, we, that Canadians think we still have that we don't have that perhaps we still need to get back. And, you know, we had it, too. If you remember, in the National Security Council, there was a unit there that was supposed to be focused just on pandemics. Uh, and uh, the Trump administration got rid of that, too. So, uh, you know, I think it is I think it just goes back to we cannot assume people are going to be doing the right thing, whether they're a government or a, or a bureaucratic institution. Creating international bureaucracy is no way to deal with it either. We can't have an international watchdog who, I mean, yeah, I guess we could, but you, but I, I've worked in a big bureaucracy. <laughs> it doesn't always do what it's supposed to do. It's really got to be the scientists, the public health folks who first get a, get a, get a indication something's happening and then they take the, the appropriate action. Uh, but again, we're going to be at the mercy of, of nations and people to do the right thing, whether you're a scientist or you're a bureaucrat. And, uh, but, we, but, but the bottom line is we got to move fast when we get finally the indication of something. We've got to be nimble. We have to be fast. We have to learn from our experiences. We have to know what we need to do. Uh, and we can't reinvent the wheel like we did last year. We have to learn from that. And when we get the indication, we have to all be prepared for it. Uh, we have to be nimble about taking action. We have to have planned and had stores of PPE and those kinds of things. We need to do the right thing now to be ready for that next pandemic or the next variation that we know is around the corner. And just to jump in, just in time logistics, we have to change the concept because there are certain things that we cannot afford to go just in time and the basic security and safety critical areas of our nation and in turn the world is one of them. And that's, that's the concept we have to change. 
Well, thank you so much to all our speakers for a fantastic discussion. And just to conclude, I think we all learned a lot today about um, preventing the next pandemic or responding quicker to it and how to come out of this one as well. And um, I think the big lesson here is that as we live in the golden age of information, we do have all the tools available to make sure that once the next crisis arrives, we are better suited to deal with it at the onset. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just with health, but also with climate crisis, with the climate crisis, for example. So uh, I would like to thank um, Jim Townsend, Leona Alislip, and Dr. Joy Fitzgibbon again for joining us and to everyone in the audience for joining us as well. And I will now hand it over to Robert Baines for final remarks. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, I think we have at least one proposal that uh, was uh, supported by all three of our speakers about uh, perhaps developing a few ideas on NATO's uh, inclusion within uh, some kind of a rapid reaction force when it comes to medical uh, supplies. Uh, I, like Jim, have been following NATO's development uh, of the transport of goods, people and supplies, mobile hospitals, and it, it is already kind of working towards that. So, so making it something that's a little more, uh, uh, you know, pre-planned would be uh, an excellent idea. Uh, so thank you uh, to, to all three of our panelists and to Maria Zelanova for uh, helping to organize this discussion. We will be uh, uh, having many more discussions like this uh, week by week. The NATO Association is dedicated to making sure these conversations really do get out there to the Canadian public. So please feel free to share this. Uh, do subscribe to us on YouTube and uh, follow us on all of our social media channels. Uh, but more importantly, talk to your friends about these issues and remind them that uh, security just doesn't happen. It needs to be maintained by many hands. and You are a part of that community. So thank you so much. And to all of our speakers, have a wonderful day and we hope to talk to you soon.